So the first thing I want to talk about is the mega trend of sustainable nutrition. And sustainable nutrition refers to the ability to provide nutrition to people in a way that's good for the people, planet, and society. And this, this idea was born out of a lot of challenges that we're facing day to day as a global society. So we have a few different issues that we're trying to address here. The first is that it's estimated that by the year 2050 to, to feed the projected population growth, we would need the equivalent of three planet Earths. And I don't think we're going to be getting two extra planet Earths anytime soon. So we have to figure out how we can produce enough food for all of these people using the planet that we have. On top of that, you have a huge nutrition imbalance where there are a, a substantial amount of people globally who are go hungry or malnourished. So we have an inequality in food distribution here. And you have also a lot of people who are getting too much food. So they're getting too much of nutrients they should be trying to limit in their diet, which increases the risk for chronic disease. And finally, on top of all of that, we have a lot of food waste. So 30% of food produced globally is wasted every day. And all of these things impact our food system a lot. So that's why this is a mega trend. It needs to be addressed in everything that we're doing. It shouldn't just be sustainability projects that you're working on. It should be whatever project you're working on should have sustainability in it in some way. And you can see that a little bit with how some of these trends relate to this mega trend. So I'll go give a high level overview of a few of these. So the first one is high stakes for sugar and salt. Sugar and salt have been on trends lists for as long as I've been in the industry. I know that the sugar has been on there for the last 10 years easily, but I think that there are a lot of factors that are causing this pressure on sugar and salt to come to a boiling point. And mostly you can see this through consumer demand for transparency, but also government action to introduce new regulations and labeling laws to interpret the nutrition of food. So you have things like the Nutri-Score in different countries in Europe. Canada just introduced their front of pack labeling scheme, which puts warnings on the front of foods if it's high in saturated fat or sodium or sugar. And the FDA in the United States are also introducing some research to determine what kind of format they want to use. So there is only going to be more and more pressure to reduce sugar and sodium as we move forward. The next one is plant-based to plant forward. So when I think of plant-based, I think of kind of what's not in a food. I think of plant-based alternatives to dairy or plant-based alternatives to meat. And I think that we'll see this trend shift a little bit more toward plant forward. So you can see on this slide here, the Culinary Institute of America introduced a, a plant forward kitchen training programs for their chefs. It's the idea of using more of the plant than just isolated proteins or fibers or components from a plant because plants are so much more than the protein or the fiber in them. So the example of a recipe you see here, seared mushroom scallops, instead of rebuilding a scallop using things like proteins and fibers, it's just using the whole plant to create a scallop. And you can see this too. So this is a, a product launch just from last year, but Chick-fil-A introduced their plant-based option on their food service menu. And instead of choosing a kind of plant-based alternative to chicken that mimics the texture of chicken, they're using cauliflower, which incorporates more of the nutrition of the plant than just the fibers of the proteins. And I think we'll see more and more of this in the future. We have protein production's future. So this really addresses the question of how do we feed a growing population with the planet that we have? And this is a huge focus on technology and development in food science. So we have the idea of cultivated meat or lab grown meat, you may have heard it called. This is the idea of growing meat tissues without requiring the growth of, of animals. Precision fermentation uses microbes or bacteria or yeast cells to grow specific proteins that would typically be found in animals. So you could create authentic dairy or egg proteins without needing to, to raise those animals using that, that technique. And plant molecular farming is a similar idea, but it uses plants as the vector to create these proteins instead of microbes. So these all have potential to drastically change the way that we produce food in the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. 
And these all lead into something that I feel like is coming up more and more in the past year due to, to global events happening, things like inflation, where affordable nutrition is a huge focus. And a lot of people think of, you know, how many calories can I get for the money I'm paying, especially individuals whenever they're shopping, but affordable nutrition should be considering more things. So it should be looking at the protein and the fiber, minerals and vitamins, while also reducing nutrients that we should limit in our diet, like saturated fat and sugar and sodium. And kind of, you can see it as an equation here. So we wanna think about all these as an efficiency ratio toward the cost that is provided. So this is affecting individuals when they're shopping due to inflation, health is still a priority, but they need to basically have less money to spend on health. Um, you can think of it with the population imbalance of nutrition where a lot of low income areas might be malnourished or improperly nourished. And you can think of it for innovation. So whenever you're screening raw materials or creating a new product, try to think of how efficiently you can fit nutrition into that product for the cost. Again, just beyond calories and protein and things like that, but the whole picture of nutrition.